Yeah. Good evening. I just arrived back from Denver, Colorado. We had a very beautiful, nice, full house night last night there in Denver. It's beautiful. Everywhere you go, more and more young people coming back to tradition, starting to keep more Shabbat, mitzvot. The shul is growing, a few shuls already. Very nice. It's always good to see. You come, you don't know what to expect. It was the first time I was there. But uh, even half an hour before the lecture, it was already 90% full. And then by the time the lecture started, many people stayed outside. Baruch Hashem. So good news. So we're back to our we uh, Monday, weekly Monday. Next uh, Monday, I won't be here. So you have a week off. <laughs> And uh, the following one, Zrat Hashem will be back as usual. We'll start to speak a little bit about the parasha, and then we'll see how much time we'll have left to speak about other topics. We saw that uh, parashat Vayakel, Vayakel means gathering, to gather the nation of Israel. The last parasha is very interesting. When Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the mountain, his face was glowing, shining. In Hebrew, the word karnu panav, koren, has, it can have two meanings. One, keren, something that keren, it, mean, it can be a horn and it can be glowing. Obviously, when the Torah speaks about Moshe comes down from the mountain, He's speaking that his face was glowing. Nobody could see him, so he needed to put a mask on his face. That's what it says, to cover this, this uh, shining face that he had. The Gentiles that were translating the Torah, they translated it as horns. That's why you have this famous artwork of Moshe Rabbeinu that have two little horns. It sounds very silly, but... Uh, the world is full of silly things, it's not, nothing new. But the interesting part is that there are millions of goyim who think that Jews have horns. It's not a joke. I have a friend who is a, used to be the champion of the United States in karate. He has a karate school in Brooklyn. He went to the Olympic Games, he represented the United States. He even won a medal, if I remember correctly. And one time he went to Texas, somewhere in Texas. Two non-Jewish girls came, and they started to speak to him. And they found out that he's Jewish, so they started to go like this <laughs> on his head. He was telling me the story. So you think it's a joke? He said, how come you don't have horns? Ignorance, I always say ignorance is the, <laughs> the biggest enemy of the person's life, you know? So, the mistake that they made is mistranslating the word. Karnu panav means shining. His face are shining. Nobody could look at him from the holiness. What really happened when Moshe went up to the mountain, his body stayed on a mountain for 40 days, like clinical death. The soul came out of the body. The soul went up to the upper world for 40 days. As we read in the Midrash in Shavuot, that the angels were fighting him. And they say Hashem, to Hashem, why are you going to, to a human being? You're giving him the Torah. So Hashem said to them, what do you need the Torah for? You don't have Yetzirah, you don't have evil inclination. You need Torah. Torah is meant to cure people from their spiritual sicknesses. You, the angels, are perfect. You're robots. You don't have Yetzirah. You don't need the Torah. It's beautiful, this Midrash, how Moshe was afraid from them because they made out of fire. This Rafim, this Saraf, it's coming from the word Soref, like fire. So the conclusion of that, when Moshe came down, obviously being with Hashem for 40 days, it's a level of holiness that nobody in history ever reached. So now this parasha is continuing from where we stopped last, last parasha. It's actually a continuation. When was that day that Moshe came down? When was that day? What day he came down from the mountain? For good. He came, down, he came down, as Hashem told him, after, after 80 days that he was in the mountain, after he broke the commandments on Shvaisra Betamuz, he went up on the 18th of Tammuz. 
and he stayed there until Rosh Chodesh Elul, it's 40 days, and from Rosh Chodesh Elul, another 40 days, Yom Kippur. He came down, and the Torah says, and the following day, meaning after Yom Kippur, the day, the 11th of Tishrei, he said to judge the nation. So Moshe judged the nation. So two things Moshe did that day, which in a way looks like a contradiction. On one hand, he, he said to judge the nation, and that's when Itro told him, how are you going to judge the entire nation by yourself? You have to nominate judges. And I explained in one of the previous lectures, uh, you don't, uh, not God forbid to make a mistake that Moshe needed Itro to tell him that he need more judges. Every fool knows it. If a person has millions of people in the nation, what does he think? He's going to be the only judge? He obviously needs hundreds of judges. So what was uh, in Moshe's mind? The, uh, first, you should ask why the Jews coming after Moshe finally showed up, right? After the horrible scene of the golden calf, and he went up to the mountain, and he finally showed up. So things are about to get better. Who has the head to, to file a lawsuit? Who wants to come to court? The, the, the greatest days in, in history are in front of them, and they have the mind to go to court. So I explain who went to court, the Egyptians, the Goim, that Moshe took them and converted them. So they still have a claim. What are the claim? They say, you robbed us. You came out of Egypt. You took all the jewelry, all the gold, everything. We want our jewelry back. Their mind is on the money. And Moshe was the only one who can judge them because he's the only one who never touched that money. He was busy searching for the, for the body of Yosef. Everyone else robbed them. No one can, I cannot be your judge if I robbed you. If yesterday I robbed your bank account, now you come to me to judge if it's fair or not. You obviously cannot be, you need somebody objective. The only one who could have judged them was Moshe. That's why he sat alone. He cannot find any other judge. It's called Nagua Badavar. He has incentive, you know, because why? Or the judge will say, oh, yeah, you deserve your money back. No, Hashem say, take the money. Who is more important, him or Hashem? This Egyptian or Hashem? Hashem said, take the money. He worked here for 286 years, really. He worked there. 210 years in Egypt, 86 years of Udat Parikh, serious work. 86 years, millions of people, 18, 16 hours a day. It adds to billions of dollars. So big deal. So they gave a little jewelry. It's not even enough for how much they tortured them. What about the mental? Compensation. What about uh, you know if if you would be judged in a court today? Who just uh, for every individual for how they torture them? They had to pay besides the work for the mental abuse. They had to pay a huge amount of money. Someone bought coffee from uh, I don't know McDonald's and it spilled on him. Had coffee and he sued them for millions. You heard that yeah. about ten years ago? I think he won even. <laughs> coffee was too hot. In this country, uh, I told you once, the first day I arrived to this country, sitting in a car, my, my father's friend was driving me from JFK to Great Neck. That was the route. So he told me, rule number one in this country, if you see someone laying down, dying on the street, don't ever dare to stop helping him. <laughs> it's the first sentence I heard in America 24 years ago. So I said to him, why? I was thinking to myself, what is it? Who case dom? Sodom and Gamora. <laughs> so he said to me, don't be a wise guy. You're going to run and help him, and then he's going to be paralyzed or something will happen to him. He will sue you. They'll take away everything you have. This is the way this country is. You come to help them, and tomorrow they sue you that you made them a permanent damage. But I think they changed the law now. They cannot sue. If you come to help a person in an accident or something, you're protected by the law. I believe now they changed the rule. Doctor or something like that, then, then it's different. But if you're like a good, good Samaritan, then. even good Samaritan, you know, the, the Gemara said that if you came, if there was fire in someone's house and you came to put the fire off and accidentally you knocked down a vase or something that worked a lot and you made him a huge damage, you cannot sue you. Why? If you allow them to sue, no one would want to help anyone in time of problem. You cannot allow. I come to help you and you sue me. Of course, accidents happen. 
But what is the other alternative? That no one will help anyone? People would be burned alive and no one would try to help them because they're afraid they sue them? It's not normal. Obviously, the law has to protect, like you say, good Samaritan citizen who wants to do the right thing. Anyway, so, so Moshe was the only one who could judge them. So in the beginning of the day, he was judging them. And then after that, what? Perhaps what happened is, we have to assume, we don't know all the details. Perhaps that after the, few, the first few, there were thousands of them. There were 40,000 Erev Rav, 40,000. So from 3 million, 40,000 is about 1.5% almost. 1.5% from the nation are Egyptians. But still idol worshippers, nothing changed in a month. They just came out. Two weeks ago, he bowed down to his uh, cow, to his, uh, to his sheep, or to the Nile. What do you think? He became uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai over, overnight? It's not exactly, you know. So what happened now? They, now they, their mind is on the money. So what happened now? Since Moshe told them, you don't have a case. You don't have a case. Why? The boss of the world that own everything said to these people to take from these people. There's nothing you can say. Now, you have to make up your mind. You want to be Jewish? You want to join the Jewish nation? Or you still want to be an Egyptian? And you have claims against the Jews. So after uh, the first case that went in, got this answer. Second case got the same answer. Everyone else went home. What's the point of waiting online? What's the point, right? It's the same thing. So he finished with them quickly. Then after that, what? That's when he gathered everyone. The chief rabbi of Israel wants to give his first speech ever. This is it. This is Vayakel. So he gathered the entire nation. How do you gather three million or more people into one place? Because you want to give them a speech. But they all stand around you. So it says like this. First question we have to ask, why Moshe did not go to them? Moshe was in one area, like a king, and they were a little bit further. So why Moshe didn't come to him? Instead of bringing all of them to him, we'd be better off. He would walk to them, no? Easier, no? What's better, to bring all the people to your home? Or if all the people are there, you come to them, and it's much easier. The answer by Shmuel, the prophet, it says, every year he went to Bet El, and to the Gilgal. There's a place called Gilgal. Veshafat et Israel. He was a portable judge. Once here he come, you know, like the Shatness guy. Every day of the week, he is in a different community. One day is there, one day is in Great Ney, one day is there. He's moving, not all the time he's in Monsi. So Shmuel come to judge them over there. So why Moshe wouldn't do the same thing? So even though Moshe is the most humble person ever live, as Hashem declared in the Torah, but Moshe has the status of a king. It's not just a prophet. Shmuel is a prophet, but who was in his time, Shaul was the king. Shmuel is only the prophet, he's not the king. When David was a king, he was the king. Shmuel was the prophet, or Nathan was the prophet. All the prophets, they were just prophets. They didn't have a status of a king. Moshe has a status of a king, which is a different, different status. Than ju- so now you have two. You're a prophet plus you're a king. It's different than Shmuel was only a prophet. Why? Because Hashem gave honors to different titles according to how high they are. Not always you can forgive this honor, because it's not yours. It's the honor of Hashem. So I'll give you an example. A father can say to his son, don't rise when I come into the house. I forgive. No problem. You can sit in my chair. I allow you. It's no problem. The Torah gave him respect. He gives up this respect, fine. As long as he says to his son like this, no problem. Someone is a big Talmud Chacham. You insult him or something like this. Even if he is a person is very humble and down to earth, and a minute later he forgot it and he forgave you, you still have a problem with Hashem. Because by insulting a rabbi, you're not insulting him. You're insulting him and the Torah that he has. Because why you went after him? You didn't go after him because he's of his beautiful eyes or his blonde hair, right? You came after him for only one reason. Why? He's the representative of the Torah, and you don't like the Torah. Or you don't like certain things that he's saying in the name of the Torah. And so what happened here? 
So it's you fighting against the representative of the Torah. Whether you like him or not, it's a different story. You have to watch what you say. What about a king? Melech shemachal al kvodo, king that forgave his honor, and kvodo machul. He doesn't have permission to forgive his honor. Why? He is the king of Israel. He is the closest, he's connecting them to Hashem. This is the leader now. Okay. If the king says, ah, it's okay, you don't have to respect me, tomorrow people will start disrespecting him. That's the end of the nation. He doesn't have permission to forgive. Now, it says like this. One time when Moshe passed away, we see in Parashat Vayelech, he was already 120 years old. 120 years old. And then, he, you know, he had to pass the kingdom to who? To Yoshua. To his student, Yoshua. So at that time, Moshe went. They, he didn't bring him to him. Why? Because he did not, he, did, he lost his status as a king. Once the new king was announced, and Hashem said, he's the new king, that second, you stop being a king. Therefore, all the honor that you had until now, you still have honor, people will still respect you, but the new king is the boss, that's it. You have to go to him, not him to you. This is the way it is. There's no shilton beyom amavet. There's no control in the time of death, as it appears in the book of Kohelet 8.8. Chapter 8, verse 8. After the sin of the golden calf, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Lech red, ki shichet amcha. Go down, because your nation made a horrible sin. Why the Torah has an extra word? The Torah should have said, Lech, go. Why does it have to say go, and then again red? Red means go down. It's like you come to a person and say, go. And then you say, go down. Either you say, go down, or either you say, go. You don't have to say, go, and then go down. He, he got the point. Just go. Why? Chazal explains, red migdulatcha. Red, you lost the status, the special status that you have. Why? Why is it his fault? The answer is, because he's the one who converted them based on his own opinion, without consulting with Hashem. If Hashem would tell them, Moshe, I want you to convert them, and then they make the golden, uh, the golden calf, Hashem wouldn't tell him, Red kishichet amcha. He would tell him, Red kishichet ami. Go, go. He would not say go down. He would say go because my nation just made a horrible sin. But over here, no. He's holding him responsible for it. So it says like this. First thing Moshe is speaking to them after he gathered all of them to him, what's the first thing? What is he speaking to them about? Shabbat. From all the topics in the Torah, he begins to give them a lecture about Shabbat. Many years ago, when I used to give weekly lectures in a Georgian shul, and one of the lectures, in the middle of the lecture, one of the Gdole Ador showed up. Rabbi Sachar Meir, it was the Rosh Yeshivat HaNegev, it was a big yeshiva in the south of Israel. At that time he was 80 or 83, something like that. He was already very old. Maybe a year or two after he passed away, I think. So he showed up in the middle of the lecture. And then, you know, I was sitting where I was speaking. There's a stage there, so I was standing on a stage speaking to the audience. And then he came and sat next to me. And then he whispered to me, focus on Shabbat. Most important thing, speak to these people about Shabbat. Everything else automatically would follow. Not that I didn't know it. It was already my own opinion already, but I was very happy to hear it from a very big chacham. And it's very, it's 100%. If you want to make someone religious the right way, you focus on Shabbat in the beginning. You explain to them that this is the foundation of everything. Vayakel lemachorat Yom HaKippurim, when he came down from the mountain, if the next day after Yom HaKippurim, as I just said to you, after he finished judging everyone, now everyone is clean, no one has stolen before the verdict, there is a rule. In heaven, they judge us same way like the bed din here judging us. If Reuven and Shimon go to court, Reuven claimed that Shimon owes him a million dollars. 
In Shamaim, they know maybe that Shimon owes him. They know he's right, Reuven. But they come to court, and this Shimon brought all kinds of witnesses to create a doubt. And the Bedin over here does not know, because they're not Hashem. After all, it's people. And they say, because we don't have a clear testimony or clear witnesses that, that he owes you the million dollar, we don't have the authority to force him to take the million dollar out of his hand and pass it to you. Why? Because we look at both of you and you, we do not really know who the money belongs to. It's your word against his word. In heaven, they know Reuven is right. If they would take the case to heaven, to Hashem, he would tell him, pay him the million dollars. But what happened if the Bedin Shalmata found him innocent? It's one thing they cannot get the money out. They don't make him innocent. They say, because of the doubt, we don't have the power to get the money out of you. Why? Because there's a rule in the Torah, Amotzi mi chavero ala Every person who wants to get money out of another person in a court, he, the burden of proof is on him. He has to supply the proof. He owes me money. So you have to show a contract or witnesses or people who saw that you gave him the money. That's what you have to do. If you don't have any proof that you gave him cash one-on-one, -on -one, that's it. You lost your money. It's already, by the way, you should know it's a sin. If you ever give a loan to someone without witnesses, if it's a check, check, it's a proof. But if it's cash, your friend asks you even $100. doesn't have to be a lot. Even $100. Can you lend me $100? I'll give it to you next week. If you give it to him one-on-one, -on -one, it's a sin. You already violated the rule of the Torah. You had to give it to him in front of witnesses. The witnesses saw here, look, I'm giving him a loan for $100. Thank you. $100. And if, if, if you give it to him one-on-one, -on -one, so you have at least in mind that it's not a loan. It's a gift. You don't have to tell him that. Next week, <laughs> it's funny how everyone looks at the glass of water. Why it's so important. <laughs> Why everyone looks at this lousy glass of water? <laughs> Can you give me one reason why it's more important than the Torah? <laughs> With so much anxiety. Wow, the glass of water. All right, so let's move on. One of the secrets of the sentence, Lo esh bechol moshvotechem beyom ha-Shabbat, do not create fire, literally it means we're not allowed to create energy on Shabbat. Anything, any, any kind of fire. But there's also a secret here. Lo tevaru esh, esh ha-machloket. When there's disagreement between people, it creates fire. When usually people have time to fight? Shabbat. No business, no stress, no work. Your boss is not on top of you. So now you have time, you see? <laughs> and the arguments begin. Talking this, and then, no, oh, you tell me what? You're wrong. No, you're wrong. Oh, the next thing, he, he gets the table out. <laughs> you know, some people, they have very hot blood, you know, hot temper. If I tell you now this story, you'll never believe me. But I promise you, it really happened. I had guests in my house one time for Shabbat, and in the middle of the argument, one of the guys took the table and flipped it in the face of the other one, in my house. <laughs> in my house, fighting with another guy. Why? Because the other guy was saying all kinds of liberal opinions that <laughs> were really annoying. <laughs> I have to admit, it was really annoying, you know. But uh, a person needs to have a, a, a red line, you know. I mean, yes, it's affecting you, you're getting emotional. You have to know the limit. You cannot be an animal, that's it. You can control yourself. So, keep Shabbat calm. Don't run into big fights and the, the, the fire of the arguments. Vayetzu kol adat bnei Israel milifne Moshe. All of them came, came out in front of Moshe. 
And what happened? Now they have to gather money to build the Mishkan. First Bet HaMikdash, but temporary. It's temporary, it's soon we're gonna see it's not so temporary, it's portable, that's the right word. Portable Bet Mikdash, you take it with you as you move. Okay, so it says like this. First it says, Vayakel Moshe et kol adat bnei Israel. Moshe gathered the entire nation of Israel. Taught them the laws of Shabbat. What came after that? He taught them how to build the Mishkan. He gave them now a lecture in art. How to create the Mishkan, all the things, all the tools, the gold, how to make it, colors, everything. Okay. And right after that, he told them everything I just taught you about the Mishkan, you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. From here we learn the 39 restrictions that are forbidden on Shabbat. Somebody asks you, where does it say in the Torah you're not allowed to do laundry on Shabbat? Where does it say in the Torah you're not allowed to put seeds in the ground? Where does it say you're not allowed to cut from the trees? Where does it say you're not allowed to grind? Where does it say you're not allowed to ripe? It only says in the Torah you're not allowed to create fire and you're not allowed to take from one territory to the other. That you can see clearly in the Torah. But the rest of the 37 other laws, where does it say it in the Torah? The answer is there are 39 law, 39 melachot, special works that they used to do in a Mishkan. One sentence in the end, today Shabbat, you cannot do it. On Shabbat, none of this, even though Mishkan is so important, is a house for God to live among us. Can you find something holier than that? Yes, Shabbat is holier than that. Shabbat puts the work on hold. Shabbat, it's above everything. Remember, on the next time you're about to be Mechalel Shabbat, you or your friends or your family or anybody that you know, remind him this. Tell him, Hashem said to make a house for him. It's very important. The Shekhinah of Hashem will be in front of people's eyes. Nothing like this happened in history. Only Mishkan and Bet HaMikdash. And first Bet HaMikdash, second Bet HaMikdash wasn't as high as the first. So the Mishkan had a very, very big holiness in it. And Hashem said on Shabbat, you don't do it. Only in weekdays. Then we move on. It says like this. Kol ish asher nesao libo, vechol asher nadva rucho. Everyone that is out allow him to donate. And everyone that is spirits allow him to donate. What's the difference? Why this is a duplication on a verse here? So it says like this. In the beginning it says, everyone came, call Adat Bnei Israel. But when it comes to actually giving the money, not everyone was happy to give. No, no, no. Over here, what does it say? Only call Ish Asher Nesao Libo. Only the ones that had a generous heart, not the stingy one. Most of the rest of them did not give. Not everyone ran to give. <coughs> so to come to hear the words of Moshe, everyone came. But to give, only individuals gave. And even the Nesim, the presidents, which were all rich and important, what did they say to Moshe? Collect whatever you need. And whatever is left over, we'll give the rest. In one hand, you can compliment them. Oh, so they're giving a guarantee. The Mishkan will be built, don't worry. We're giving you here a personal guarantee. Here's a blank check. Blank check, write whatever you want. Very nice, no? But it wasn't good enough for Hashem. Why? Hashem loved people who want first to give. Don't wait to see what everyone gave, and then in the end, no, what can I do? I have to give the rest. No, 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 run. I'm going to be the first one. What's the difference between the first one that gives and the last one, or the, the ones that comes after? What's the difference? Huge difference. Even they all gave the same amount. He gave a thousand, he gave a thousand, he gave a thousand. First one gets reward more than all of them. Why? Because he opened their hearts. It's like a pioneer, like in a war. One per scream. After me! And everyone gets the courage, and they all begin to run. Who gets the credit for everyone? The first one. One who screams, we have to build a good shul here. 
And everyone say, yes, you're right, we are with you. They all get a nice reward, but it gets much bigger than them. Nachshon jumped into the water. Without Nachshon, we would be, we be dead by then. We wouldn't make it out of Egypt. Well, we couldn't cross the water. He went into the water, the water reached his nose, Hashem split the, the Red Sea. Without Nachshon, no one had the guts to go in. They were waiting for the water to open. Nachshon said, I don't care, Hashem promised he's going to take us to, out of Mitzrayim, he's going to give us the Torah, he brings us to Israel. Like in Hebrew, there is an expression, it's called Rosh Katan, small head. You know what it means, small head? Don't be a wise guy, just follow the instruction. But it can also be a negative meaning. Rosh Katan means playing dumb. You know, it's called Italian strike. You know what it means? Shvita Italkit? Italian strike? That you do whatever they tell you, but you know how you do it, like 90 years old. And, then, and everything they tell you, you pretend four or five times that you don't hear. You drive them crazy. Like they do here, you go sometimes to places, you see all these people that work in all kinds of public jobs. <laughs> if you want them to move, you have to take a few, few dollar bills, you make noise, oh, all of a sudden, it's badly recharged. Here in America, you have to be smart. Let's say you do a job, you make moving, you move your house. Most people, they give the tip in the end of the job. No, no, it's not good, because they don't want to work. You come to them before, you say to them, listen, I'm going to give each one of you this amount of tip. If I'll be happy, you work good. Each one of you get that, that amount of money. Oh, you should see how they run. I did it once, <laughs> telling you from experience. I don't know what they were happy more than the tip or the cerveza I promised them. <laughs> you know what cerveza is? Beer. I told the amigos, I have a whole case of good cerveza, I put it in the fridge by the time you finish. <laughs> the Mashiach came for them. <laughs> it, got, it got to a point that we moved one big closet, so heavy, you have to bring it to the second floor. But it wasn't supposed to be in the second floor, it was supposed to be in the first floor. So I didn't know, I told them to take it upstairs. They already, four of them bringing it up. Then, no, it's not good, it has to be over here. No problem, senor. <laughs> the power of cerveza and a nice tip. After the job, what, is good, what good is that? Takes the money and leave. And now you cannot tell him, oh, I'm not happy from the way you work, so I won't give it to you, because it's Hilul Hashem. You have to give him the tip. Give him before. You get a lot more for your money. As I started to explain, the Torah says there are two kinds of people who give donation. Two kinds of people, we learn it from here. One, Asher Nesao Libo. Nose means carry. Heart, Libo, means his heart. His heart carry him up. We'll try to, to understand this expression soon. And the second one, Asher Nedava Libo. That his heart is pushing him towards generosity. What's the difference? Obviously, there's a difference between them. Otherwise, the Torah would not repeat it twice with different variation here. So it says like this. Asher nesao, carry him up, means that the donor forced himself to give more than what he can. You know, it's a big amount for him. It's not in his league. But he say, I don't care. I'm going to trust Hashem. I give it no matter what. Whatever happened, happened. I don't care. Right now, I'll do it. I know it's too much for me. I know I need a miracle to make it back. I do it. That's it. That's one. That's Asher Nesa Olibo. And the other one, Asher Nedavo Libo, means someone who gives only based on his abilities. When he has good days in business, he gives a lot. When he has bad weeks, he gives little. It's also good, of course it's good. But it doesn't show any confidence in Hashem by this guy. It's, it's like saying to Hashem, first you give me, then I'll give. You don't give me, I don't give. 
But someone who says, I, I trust you to give me. If it's not tomorrow, it's next week. That's what they need right now. Here is the money. This is a much higher level. But it also can be stupidity. And the difference between a confident in Hashem to a fool sometimes is a very thin line between them. That's why Judaism is the only religion that the Chachamim, the sages, needed to make a law that a person, an average person, not talking about the billionaire, zillionaire, we're talking average person will not give more than 20% donations. You have to limit the people from not giving too much. Why? Some people are, that's their life, to give, to give, to give. So they told him, give up to 20%. 10% minimum, you must give, it's not yours. Maaser, from the net profit, you must give. You want to give more than 10? Very, very good. Make sure it stay up to 20 from the net income. However, if you Bill Gates, you can give 99% of your money for donation. The 1% you have left will be more than enough for you and your grand-grand-grandchildren for eternity. No worry. From the 66 billion, you can give 60 billion. Leave yourself six. Your grand-grand-grand-grandparents will still enjoy the interest of that money. Don't worry. And that's what he does, by the way. All these billionaires, they give a lot of donations. They're teaching the world that they got the point. Why God gave me so much? To give to others. But there are people who also have a lot and they don't want to give anything to anyone. Even that they know tomorrow I'm dying, now it's the time to open the bunkers and the hidden money. they rather die and the money would stay under the ground than to give it out to the miserable people. That's cool. It's not a joke. There are people like this. You ask him, hey, hey, Mr. X, you have 10 hours to live. You don't have children. You have $5 million hidden over there. Can I go and take the money and give it out? No, 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 leave it over there. But wow, what do you... Maybe he's planning to come back in reincarnation, <laughs> hoping he's going to remember where the money is. Yes, that's called Tsar Ain. You know what Tsar Ain is? There's two different kinds of jealous people. There's a jealous person that say, I don't care that he has. Let him have as much as Hashem wants. I'm happy for him. But I also want at least the same. It's not fair why he's yes and not me. That's one average jealous. Most jealous are like this. But there are jealous people who are already mentally sick. Which means, even if he makes a million and the other miserable guy made a thousand, it bothers him. Bothers him. He's in bed, he's getting up, coming to the terrace. <laughs> Moshe, what's happened? I'm, I have atzabim. I'm very in an anxiety attack. Why? His cousin made a thousand. He made a million. But his eyes on the thousand he made. Why? It's sickness. You cannot see people having anything. It's called tsarain. Ask many people in Israel that bought a brand new car what happened to them within a week. You know what happened to them? Huge line. Someone comes with a key and make a line of scratch on a car. Why are they doing it? Why these people are so evil? Why? I don't have, you won't have. I'm on the way to the bus. You driving this car? No. Shh. That's it. I'll just show you what kind of people we have in our world. That's called Tsare Ain. But their eye is very narrow. They cannot see anything that anyone has. It's an expression. A mishkan, how did they fund the mishkan? How? The answer is, as I just explained, from donations. So why did I just ask? If I just explained that in the last 10, 20 minutes, obviously there's something hiding inside the question. Which donations? The nation of the no, donations of the nation of Israel only, not the Erev Rav. The Egyptians that just came out and Moshe attached them to the nation of Israel, they, didn't, they did not give any donations for the Mishkan. That's why it says, Asher review Bnei Israel that the nation of Israel brought. And then, after a while, the Erev Rav started to be embarrassed. In the beginning, they were angry. Why? A few hours ago, Moshe just told us that we lost the case. 
that all the money that the Jews took from us, we're not entitled to get it back. So they're still angry. They don't want to give. But then after a few hours, it's pressure from everyone around you. Everyone donates, run to give, and you don't want to give. Then it may look like we, we're going against the nation. So what, what, we converted, and at the same time, we don't want to donate to the house of God. How can it be? So they started to have pressure. So they later also started to bring. So what did they tell them? Oh, thank you very much. We have more than enough. Daive hotel. It's plenty. They didn't want to take their money. So they told them there's too much. Every time you say Am, the nation, without the nation of Israel, remember it's Erev Rav. So they, when they brought, they told them, no, we have more than enough. So they start bringing. Why? Okay, they don't need, they have enough. When did you ever hear in the history that you come to a Jewish institution or non Jewish, any non profit organization, a synagogue, a church, a mosque, and you come and you tell them, I, I brought a nice donation. I want to write a check. And they tell you, oh, right now we're good in a bank account. We have enough. Ask us next year if we need money. Did it ever happen? No. So how this Egyptian did not suspect that something is fishy here? <laughs> of course they know, but they're very happy. <laughs> oh, you know, that, Baruch Hashem, they told me I don't need. <laughs> what is it like? Like sometimes, there's somebody who is in a need, and you're not exactly crazy about him. But you feel horrible, you know he needs help, and if you're not going to help him, who knows what can happen. So you call him, offering him help, and you read three Pirkei Teilim that he will say, no, I manage already. <laughs> and when he tells you, oh, I, I, I'm, so, I'm so appreciative, thank you very much, but I already manage, he say, you sure? <laughs> now I got the mitzvah and I don't have to do it. Why? You're not crazy about it. That's the way people are. They stop bringing. There's only twice in the whole Torah that you have this word, Vaikhle. Yud Chaf Lamed Aleph. Where? First time, Vaichlea Geshem, when the, the flood by Noah, after 40 days, when the water stopped, when the rain stopped, what does it say in Genesis 8, verse 2? It says, Vaichlea Geshem, the rain stopped. And over here, it also says, Vaichlea Amile Avi, they stop bringing. The rain stopped, and they stop bringing. Obviously, there's connection, like Zera Shava. Vaichle, Vaichle, there's connection between those two verses. Now you're going to understand something that technically sounds strange. What does the Gemara say? The Gemara say, it says in Masechet Ta'anit, page 8, it says like this, En akshamim netzarim, the rain stops, Ela one of the main reasons why there is no rain in Israel, no rain, the farmers are dying. Another week or two like this, everything we planted goes to the garbage. Why? People promise to give donations and they don't keep. They don't keep. Like, remember what I told you in one of the lectures. You know what's the difference between this generation to the previous generation? In this generation, people kiss the Torah with their hand and give tzedakah with their mouth. In the previous generation, people give tzedakah with their hand and kiss the Torah with their mouth. So that's the opposite. <laughs> Instead of kissing the Torah with the mouth, they stand like this. And they give tzedakah with the mouth. They speak a lot. The Gemara says, what's the difference between a tzaddik and rasha? Righteous and wicked. What's the difference? The wicked speaks a lot and do nothing in the end. The righteous, they speak very little and do a lot. They speak very little, say a few words, and they do a lot more than what they say. Why? 
I don't want to make a big show of here. One more thing. Betzalel, Hashem said that he's filling up the heart of Betzalel with wisdom, special wisdom. To be an artist, to design such a place like the Mishkan, it's not just a carpenter or someone who knows how to make things. You need a very special spiritual divine power. And the Torah said that Hashem filled up Betzalel with Ruach HaKodesh. He has like a vision, like a prophet. So it says that Vayas Betzalel et Aaron atzei shitim. From all the things of the Mishkan, the easiest thing to make was what? Supposedly, Aaron, a box made from wood. Atzei shitim. Well, wood, every good carpenter knows how to make it. The rest was with gold, silver, all kinds of very complicated things. The master of the whole work, he took for himself something that looks the easiest. It makes sense? From all the things, this is what Bezalel made? So the answer is, the Torah emphasized that he did it without any help. Everything else, few workers did together, not one person. All of them. Over here, he took it and he made it from A to Z, all by himself. So what's special about it? Every little detail here has a lot of is a deep meaning in it. So it says, like this, the tools of the Mishkan, everything that they made for the Mishkan, did not last for a long time. After a while, they replaced them. Every once in a while, they replaced them. They broke. They started to become, you know, loose. Even the menorah, that they made the menorah, they replaced the menorah. It wasn't the same menorah all the time after lighting, 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 lighting with oil. After a while, you replace it. Just Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon alone, made ten menorot in his time for the first Bet HaMikdash. Ten different ones. It's appear in Melachim Aleph, Kings, Kings A, chapter 7, verse 49. And also in the Gemara, in Menachot, page 29. But the Aaron was once for always. It was made once and left forever. What's special about it? You put the Ten Commandments inside. The, bro the broken ones that Moshe broke. And the complete one, that is, he got second ones, the second one. The first one was holier than the second one. Why? Because the first one, the tablet, everything Hashem made from A to Z. He got that sapphire, whatever you call it. He got it, he shaped it, he wrote everything on it. The second one, he said to Moshe, you go and prepare it, and I will write the Ten Commandments on it. It's not as high as the first one. To teach us, when you make a scene, yes, you can make tshuva, and it seems that you corrected the situation. But it will never be like the first original time. Never. Always will be less. This is why I always give this example from Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon made a scene. And then he, re he realized how horrible is, it see, is his scene. So he made tshuva for 130 years. You know what it is? He lived 930 years. 130 years from, a life, from his life is almost 20%. It's like 15% from his life. 15%. If a person today in our days live uh, 80 years, it's like almost 16, 17 years of his life to do tshuva every day. So, so who can do such thing? It's very, very high tshuva. In the end, fine. He made tshuva, but the angel never came back to serve him. The angel that used to serve him before the sin disappeared, and even after he made tshuva, yes, in a place that the Baal tshuva stands, even religious from birth cannot reach. Why? Speaking about the reward and the merit, but technically, is he going back to his status before the sin? Absolutely not. No. And Dome, it's not the same. Here, there's many examples like this. Many examples. Yes, it saves from the punishment. It gives a lot of reward. 
that, uh, that Hashem claims the respect for the Baalei Tshuva. He loves them very much. The, like the Rambam say yesterday, he was despicable in the eyes of Hashem. He was hated. He was down in his eyes, the eyes of Hashem. And now when he made Tshuva, he's loved, he's welcome, he's blessed. A uh, list of compliments. But it doesn't say that he returned back to his clean status. No. Yeah, it's fine. Same thing to the second commandment. Why Hashem couldn't make another one? Fine. No, I, well, Hashem goes like this. And you have a second command. No, no, go and sweat now to prepare a whole thing. It's a lot of work. By the way, you should know, Moshe broke the commandments being zealous to Hashem when he saw what they're doing. They don't deserve to get it. He broke it. But really, the truth is that Moshe did not throw it like we think on the floor. He didn't have the nerve to break it. What happened? The commandments are very, very heavy. A regular person cannot hold such things. It's very tall and big and heavy. It's all it's stone. What happened is that the, the commandment, the letters are carrying them up. The letters that Hashem wrote on it, they are the one that makes the commandment go, works against the law of gravity. But after the scene, when what happened, Moshe saw, he saw the letters are coming out of the commandments one by one. The otiot porchot ba'avir, so from the weight of it, he just couldn't hold it, and it fell on the floor. This is really the secret of this, what happened in the Ten Commandments. Same thing in Asara, Asar, Rugem Malchut, when they took uh, Rav Yossi Bar Kisma, and they burned him, I think it was Rav Yossi Bar Kisma, they burned him with the Sefer Torah. So they asked him, what are you seeing, Rabbi? So he said, I saw letters are flying all over. The letters, the Torah is burning with him, around him. The Roman told him, tell me if I burn you faster, because they put curtains with water, that they will burn for a long time. That's how cruel these Romans were. So the guy, the, the, the casador, the, the soldier over there, he told him, tell me, Rabbi, if I'll burn you faster, I'll make the fire go in one shot and take the curtain out. You take me with you to Olam Abba? You take me with you to heaven? And he said to him, yes. And he said, no, I want you to swear. In the name of God, swear to me that you take me with you to heaven. And he swore to him. And he took it out. He brought the fire higher. He killed him quickly. And he jumped and hugged him and got burned with him. And Rabbi Udana see that wrote the Mishnah was standing over there and started to cry. He was jealous with this guy, these Roman soldiers. He said, we work all our life, 120 years from morning to night, maybe we'll make it to heaven. And this guy in one minute made it to heaven in express. And this is where the expression came from, yesh adam kone olamo berega achat. Sometimes a person can buy eternity in one moment. That's why I always tell people. One good donation for CDs, and it goes to thousands of Jews, and hundreds of them begins to keep mitzvot. That's it. Kanita et olamcha. Doesn't mean you can start making sins, or stop coming to shul, or start uh, doing all kinds of uh, things that you're not supposed to. Don't take advantage. On uh, finally, Hashem gives you a bonus. Now it's oh, I'm okay. Doesn't work this way. It's like someone who works in a good company. And they're very happy for him. So they want to give him the end of the year in Christmas. They want to give him a bonus. <laughs> so they want to give him a $1,000 bonus. So as soon as they give him the bonus, he said, listen, next week I don't come to work. <laughs> so they said, what happened? So said, ah, now I don't need to work. Like this, I was working day by day. Now he gave me this check. I can take it easy now. So you fool. I'm not giving you this check that you become a bad worker. I want to encourage you to be even greater. Same thing here. You got, you made a big donation, you're going to save thousands of people. That's not a reason now to go down. What did you got do by that? <laughs> so it says like this. The Aaron, Yetzira Chat Pe'amit. A one-time creation is the Aaron that uh, Bezalel made. And the boards were inside, the commandments. Until when? Until Yehoshiahu, the king, ganaz at the Taron. He buried it somewhere. It's not destroyed. It never got burned. It never got broken. The king, Yehoshiahu, buried it somewhere. And when Mashiach comes, we'll know where. But right now, it's hidden somewhere.
You know, in two weeks ago I explained that the women came and brought their mirrors. They brought their mirrors and they wanted to make the kior. They want to make it with the mirrors of the women and Moshe didn't want to take it because a woman who puts her makeup with these mirrors, now you want to give it to me for the, for the mishkan, for the house of God. And Hashem said to him, ah, before you look down at them, thanks to these mirrors, babies were born in Egypt, and thanks to these mirrors, I have a nation. Imagine if they would not be pretty for the husband, then nobody would be born. You would not have anyone to talk to today. That's basically it, the conversation between Hashem and Moshe. But there's something here that's going to shock you. That's why before I read it, I want to warn you. It's not, don't say tomorrow, Rabbi Mizrahi said in his lecture, be careful. <laughs> say, Rabbi Meir Mirotenburg, Amara Mirotenburg, which was the rabbi of the Rosh. In Shulchan Aruch, there are three giants, Chachamim, of the last two, thousand years. Rif, Rambam, and the Rosh. Rif from Morocco. Rambam from Spain, who went to Egypt. And the Rosh from Ashkenaz. Ashkenazi. Three biggest Chachamim in Halakha in the last thousand years. And who was the rabbi of this Rosh? The Maharami Rotenburg. He was such a holy person, the Goim put him in jail and they wanted ransom to release him, and he refused. He told them, no one is allowed to give the money. I better rot in jail for the rest of my life, then you release me with money. Why? Because he knew if they will succeed, this wicked Goim that kidnapped him, then every week they'll do the same thing. They kidnap this rabbi, they it will never end. So he gave up his life, that the Goim would see, eh, it didn't help. And when he died in jail, they did not release his body, the cruel ones. They didn't release his body. We're talking almost 800 years ago. They left the body by them. They don't give the body. Just like the Hamas and Hezbollah and all these Arabs, when they have an Israeli soldier, even for the bodies, they claim to, they want to receive thousands of prisoners for a body of an Israeli soldier, for a body. And they give them. Why? One smart person say, just show you that one dead Jew equal like a thousand live um, terrorists. These Arabs, <laughs> thousand of them equal like one dead body of a Jew. Why? This is the deal. Give us one or two bodies, we'll give you a thousand terrorists for it. Live, living terrorists. Why? The body. In Judaism, the holiness of the body, the, the respect of the body, it's something very high. But the point is, this is what he says. The Maharam Mirotenburg, he says like this, Arura Aisha Sheyesh Labaal Veena Mitkashetet Ve Arura Aisha Sheen Labaal U Mitkashetet Arura means cursed. Where do we find in the Torah that cursed, Arur? It's the worst curse in the Torah. Where do we find it? Who did Hashem curse by this word, Arur? A snake. Arur atami kol chayat asadeh. You're going to be cursed from all the animals in the field. This is what Hashem said to the snake after the sin. Arur. Also, when Avraham sent Eliezer to find Shiduch for his son Yitzchak, Eliezer had a daughter. He wanted. So he said to him, Avraham, En Arur midabek bebaruch. You're a wonderful tzaddik. Eliezer was a Evet Knani. He was from Knan. And he said to him, I know you're righteous. By the way, you should know Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, is one of the ten people who went to heaven with their body. Bechayem. Hashem took him, picked him up. So that's how holy he was, this Eliezer, servant of Abraham. And after all that, he wanted his daughter to marry Yitzchak, and Abraham told him, it cannot be. We are the blessed one in the Torah, and the Torah cares Knan, Noach, after, after Noach woke up, he drank wine, he woke up, he saw what his son did to him. Who was his son? Ham. Ham had four sons. Uh, what? Mitzrayim, one of them. Kush, Put, and Knan. Knan was the fourth son. So when Noah saw that Ham casterized him, that he cannot have other kids, so he told him, you made me unable to have a fourth son, 
I'm cursing your fourth son, Knan. What is it? Arur, Knan. Will be cursed. This nation is cursed. Knanim. They will be slaves all the time. The question is, okay, Noah is angry at Ham, but why is he cursing supposedly innocent kid? Why the kid has to pay for his father's sin? The answer is not innocent. He is the one who called his father to come see Noah naked in a tent. Abba, Abba, come see grandpa naked drunk in a tent. Ah, instead of going and covering your grandfather, you're running to call people to see? That's the price he paid. So Abraham told him, you are cursed. You come from a cursed nation. We came from a blessed nation. A curse and a bless cannot marry. It doesn't go together. This is Abraham. Abraham in the Torah. So the Maharam say like this. A woman that has a husband and she's not becoming beautiful for him, she's cursed, chas v'shalom. Arur. Arur. Arur This is the words of the Maharam in Rottenburg. Not a rabbi from En Harod, or from Kibbutz Yavne. We're talking a giant in, in a level in a league of Rashi and Rambam. It's not, uh, you have to shake when you hear this name. And at the same time, he say a woman that is single and becoming too beautiful when she goes out to the street, also Arura. Who are you getting beautiful for? For Tony and Vini in the supermarket? For who? <laughs> no? I always say that as a part of the joke, how women today, when they run to buy milk and some things, and how half an hour they put their wigs, that, and this, they change their clothes, they run to the supermarket. But when they come, they ah, you know, the house is used to me already. But the Maharami Rottenburg said it 800 years before me, in a much more strict way. This is the word of the. I was shocked when I saw it. I didn't know it. I only saw it a few days ago. Why does Marot, this mirror's call, a Marot atzovot? What does it mean in Hebrew, tzovot? Where the word tzava come from? Tzava means when a, per, when a group of people, tzove, attacking a place, tzove, tzovot, comes from the world to ambush, to attack. That's why the language is also tzava. David Amelech made a eulogy to Jonathan, the son of Shaul Amelech, Shaul the king. And what did he say to him? A Tzvi Israel, he called him. Tzvi. What's the name Tzvi? In, Jew, in Judaism, you have a lot of people named Tzvi. Where this name Tzvi came from? Tzvi in Hebrew means also deer. So why? People call their son deer? <laughs> Good thing they didn't call him horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hamor ben Shechem. I don't get it, how this guy called his son Hamor. <laughs> That's one of the biggest mysteries in my eyes in the Torah. And Hamor was well known to everyone that he's a donkey. <laughs> Imagine now a Brit Milad, the Moel Kam, the, the Abiyah Ben, everyone is excited. <laughs> So the Moel said, he carries more with Israel. He said, Hamor. It will be the shock of the century. <laughs> so he called him a Tzvi Israel. Tzvi means Tiferet, glory. Tzvi Tifartecha, it appears in Yeshayahu. In Isaiah 13, verse 19, what does it say? Tzvi tifartecha, the prophet speaks to Hashem, Tzvi. Tzvi la tzadik, it says also in Yeshaya in, in 24, verse uh, 16. Tzvi tifarto, also in Yeshaya. He used this expression a lot, Tzvi, as glory. Tzvi hi, Eretz Tzvi hi lechol haaratzot. Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. It's called Eretz Tzvi, a land of Tzvi. What Tzvi? Two meanings. One is the glorious nation in the whole world. As the Torah says, this is the land that the eyes of your God is in it from the beginning of the year until the end of the year, all the time. So obviously it's the, the holy land, as the old Goim understand that as, as well. But it also has another meaning. Tzvi means... 
Deer. And deer has something special about his skin. What about it? When you heat it up, you stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and it becomes a lot wider and wider and it doesn't get ripped. Eventually it would get ripped, but it, it's very elastic. You can stretch it and more and more and more. Why they use this word Eretzvi when so many thousands of Jews came to Yerushalayim in the three festivals Technically, there was not supposed to be enough room for so many hundreds of thousands of men. They all coming with their children, with their animals, coming all the way to Yerushalayim. Where everyone? Yerushalayim wasn't as big as you see today. Yerushalayim expanded, Betar, this, all these Ramot. We're talking Yerushalayim was a little bit smaller than now, a lot more. So how everyone fit in Yerushalayim? And there was always room for everyone. Everyone. Why? It's like uh, elastic. It's stretched. The more people come, no problem. There's always, this is like some kind of a illusion over there that no matter how many people would come, there's always going to be room for them. That's why they call it Eretz Tzvi, Prophet Ezekiel. Many other palms in the, in the past, they, they used those words Tzvi to, to, to emphasize beauty and glory. But also Tzvi comes from, like I said, Tzavah. This is Rashi. Rashi say that it comes from the word tzava. Yatsu kol tzvaot Hashem eretz Mitzrayim. Tzvaot, tzava means also a group, a large group of people. Look how all the words in the holy language are all connected. It's amazing. What a brilliant language. This is when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt. They didn't have an army. But what does this say in the Torah? Yatsu kol tzvaot Hashem. All the armies of God from Egypt came out of Egypt. What does it mean? Not army like you think with Uzi machine gun. Army means groups of peoples. Now, before we finish, one more thing about the Mishkan. There's a very interesting question. The Torah, it's eternal. We all understand that, right? Everything in the Torah is for eternity. The Mishkan, it's temporary. It's supposed to be portable for X amount of years until we go into the land and we build the permanent Bet HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. So how long the Mishkan should last? X amount of years, and that's it. Why the Torah wrote so many verses about the Mishkan? More than two full chapters is all about the Mishkan, how to make the Mishkan. If it was something portable, temporary, why there's so much speaking about the Mishkan? Speak about Bet HaMikdash. Why all the Torah is highlighting the Mishkan, Mishkan? If somebody is moving into a mansion in Beverly Hills, and in the meantime he has to make a tent, you know how they bring the tents with heat, and they build it outside in the backyard until the construction is finished? So imagine now he got a book, Three quarters of the book is about the tent, and a quarter of the book is about the mansion. Doesn't make sense, no? Should be a little bit about the tent, and the rest speaking about the permanent house. Good question, no? The answer is the first temple, first Bet Hamikdash. How many years it was standing? Four hundred and ten years. Second temple, how many years? 420. In between that 70 years after, after the first one was destroyed until the second one was built. So, 410 and 420 years. How many years the Mishkan was standing? The Mishkan, the portable Mishkan, how many years? What do you think? The Mishkan was standing 486 years, more than each one of the temples. No wonder the Torah spoke so much about it. Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, he brought the Mishkan to Yerushalayim. They brought the Mishkan into Israel when they came in. And Shlomo HaMelech, it's 300 years after the Yoshua Benun. Yoshua occupied the land in 14 years. And only 300 years later, Shlomo HaMelech built the Bet HaMikdash. 
So in Shlomo HaMelech built Bet HaMikdash, they still had the Mishkan in Eretz Israel all the 300 years. And when they finally made Hanukkah Tabayit, they still had the Mishkan. So what do you do? Now you have a permanent house. What do you need this Mishkan? What did they do with that? Most people, I didn't find even one person who knew this. Very hard to know this detail. It's interesting. It says in Melachim Aleph, in Kings, chapter 8, verse 4, what does it say over there? In the day of Hanukkah HaMikdash, when the grand opening of Bet HaMikdash by King Solomon, right? The Gemara also speaking about it. The Gemara says, Mikdash Rishon, when the temple was built, first one, Nignaz Oil Moed. Oil Moed, Nignaz. Nignaz means buried somewhere, hidden. Not destroyed, Chas Shalom. Where was it buried? Where? Where is the Mishkan today? I want to go and find it today. Where is it? Don't laugh. I can tell you the location. You won't find it on Google Map <laughs> or in Google Earth. You don't find it. But where is it? Under the tunnels of the Echal in Bet HaMikdash in Yerushalayim. And that means now where you see the Kotel HaMaravi, somewhere deep inside over there, the Mishkan is hidden. This is Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 9. The Mishkan was used as Bet HaMikdash more years than all temples, the first and the second. And even when they put it out of commission, they never burn it, they never broke it. It stay as it is, they put it down in the ground under the, Mishk under the temple. So it's still, until today, the Mishkan is there somewhere. Never got destroyed. <laughs> That's what it means, v'asu li, mishkan v'shachanti betocham. Li, lishmi, for me, for my name. La'ad ule'olmei olamim. Forever. That's why the Torah spoke so much about it. After the sin of the golden calf, this is what Hashem said. Hashem said, it's known to me that my children are future to make a big scene. And instead of destroying them, I rather destroyed my home. This is in the Midrash, in Psikta Rabati 2. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem said, Yecharev Bet HaMikdash ve'al tiga yadi batzadikim. Better I'll destroy my temple, my home, woods and uh, rocks, whatever there is over there than to kill Chaz Shalom, the righteous people. And uh, Midrash of Echa, Echa Rabba, Midrash Rabba on Echa, also uh, uh, too, it says like this, there was an, a necessity to bury the Mishkan and to build the Mikdash. Why? If you keep the Mishkan, you cannot destroy it and burn it like you do with the, with the Beta Mikdash. It seems v'avanim. You need something permanent, something permanent that everyone see how it's destroyed and go on fire. That's like a replacement of a tragedy of the life of the people. So this is what we always say, and this is what we say in Tisha B'Av, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu threw all his anger on it seems v'avanim, on, on wood and rocks, instead of Chaz Shalom destroying us after the horrible sin. And the last thing for now, it says like this, Mizmor le'asaf, in Teilim, there is Mizmor. What is the Mizmor? Elokim, God, Ba'u goim benachalatecha. The nations came into your territory, into Bet HaMikdash. The sages are asking, this is a very sad song. Why you call it Mizmor? Mizmor is something happy. It should have been Kina. Kina, it's when you cry and you, and, you, and you sing something sad, you cry, that's called kina. Mizmor means, oh, brit milah, chatuna, that's mizmor. Happy song. So why they write in Tehilim, mizmor, 
the goyim came to destroy Beit Hamikdash. Oh, let's make a party out of it. Well, what's going on? Chachamim asking this question. Amrulo le Asaf. Asaf is the one who wrote this mizmor. He said to him, "Hakadosh Baruch Hu echriv echalu Mikdash v'atay Yoshevum Zamer." Hashem destroyed his home, and you sitting and singing here. So he told them, "I'm singing, and I'm happy that instead of killing us, Hashem killed the woods and the rocks. That's why it's mizmor. It should have been us, but He replaced us with them. So how can I not be happy? We got away easy. Of course, it's mizmor." Should have been a lot worse. We're done. We finished this parasha. We covered the important thing. Maybe a few more minutes to speak about something else. The prophet Yeshaya, Isaiah, this is what he wrote. Lachen shimu dvar Hashem. Therefore, listen to the word of God. Anshelatzon. People that are behaving like clowns. Making fun. What we call today sarcastic or, you know, this kind of people. Moshle Amazeh, Asher Yerushalayim, The clowns who sits in a government in Jerusalem. Listen to this prophecy, how he speaks about our days. כי אמרתם, קראתנו בריתי מוות. You say we made peace with the terrorists, with that. ואם שאול עשינו חוזה, and we made a contract with שאול. שאול means it's one of the seven places in hell. Obviously it's not something good. שוד שוטף, כי יעבור. That, that contract you made with these murderers, will not survive. You are hiding behind false, false belief and false optimism. None of these pieces, peace that you make with these Arabs will ever survive. Nothing. They'll never leave you alone. We hide behind the lie, fooling the nation. We give them land, we'll do this, we'll give them rights, we'll give them that, we'll give them that. Maybe they leave us alone. What does the history show? The more you give, the more they torture you. Cut, sharp, simple, black and white. It's not open for debate. Since we gave what we gave, what did we get in return? Rockets. Every week, even to this week, rockets. And when it's two, three rockets, nobody even talk about it anymore. Only when it's hundreds, they begin to talk. This is the situation. Little Israeli children, they go out, they try to go to kindergarten. Ooh, sirens. Rockets falling in the neighborhood. Imagine if the American Indians would shoot one rocket at New York City. What would happen to them? They and their casino, not will go on fire. They will go to, not Siberia. Siberia, it's a picnic. Then what the United States will do to them? for shooting rockets on uh, innocent citizens. But the same Americans who will destroy any enemy will shoot one rocket at them, saying to the Israeli, don't be aggressive. Let them release pressure. <laughs> don't be aggressive. <laughs> and what does it say in the end? Va'aitem lo lemirmas. In the end, they will step over you with their legs on your head. That's what it means, mirmas. Mirmas, it's called romes, when you step on someone's head and bury him in the sand. That's called romes. It's an expression of taking someone's dignity all the way to the lowest level. We should know, I'm preparing you right now. About, few, about a week ago, the Israeli government passed a law that in the state of Israel, it's a crime to be a Torah scholar. That's basically what the law says. If you get to an age that you're supposed to go to the Israeli army, until now, since Ben-Gurion, 65 years, 
All the people who sit full days and learn Torah were dismissed from going to the army. It's called Torah-tam omanutam. Since all their life they sit and learn Torah, the secular first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, gave them a free pass to sit and learn Torah, even though he was a communist, he was anti-religion, he was not eating kosher food, he, his son married a Goya, he had a granddaughter that is Goya, and many other problems. He gave them free pass. And also, at one point, he wanted to take to the army the, the religious girls, and the Chazonish went to see him. And after the meeting with Chazonish, he gave up that plan also. Also, the same Ben-Gurion wrote that the Israeli state must observe the Sabbath, must give respect to the Sabbath, because it's a Jewish state. It's not a regular state. Very interesting. Not that he kept the Sabbath, or none of his friends kept it, but in as part as his poetry, he wrote that Shabbat is a special day in a Jewish state. That's why he was against uh, public uh, transportation. For many years, there was no public transportation. You can see a minor difference between Shabbat and other days of the week. Even though the, most of the nation do not keep Shabbat, unfortunately. But today, everything just changed now. What happened now? Now they already put one, one religious kid that 18 years old in jail because they wanted him to go to the army, but he sits in yeshiva and learns, so they put him in jail. Now they want to put everyone in jail. We don't really know what Hashem wants here. It could be maybe the greatest thing that happened to us. Everyone looks at that negative. But it could be that from Az Yetzeh Matok, there's an expression, me Az, Az means something strict, bad. Matok means sweet. Sweet comes out of Az. What, what does it mean? If they will take them with handcuffs, all of them to jail. We're talking, I don't know, 80,000, 100,000 people. First of all, there's no jails for them. That's one thing. So they put them in jail. So what's going to be in jail? What are they going to do in jail? They sit and learn Torah. And who's going to pay? The government is going to have to pay. <laughs> because you have to build jails. You have to put air conditioning, heat, electric, tables, chairs, beds. So what's the problem? Instead of me raising money for my yeshiva, my guys will sit in jail and the government will pay for the yeshiva. That's one option. Second option, if somebody will be clever there and say, not throw Jewish kids for learning Torah into jail. Come on, we're not Nazis. We're not the Romans. Someone has to scream enough. I believe that someone will be responsible enough in the last minute to say, hey, we went too far. Enough with this nonsense. So what's going to be? What's going to be in that case? They leave them alone. They leave them alone, so they go back to learn as it is. That's second option. There's a third option. Third option is that the religious people will not be brave enough. That the big chief rabbi say, we have to give our life not to go to leave the Torah. It's not about the army. It's about leaving the Torah. This is really what we have to understand. It could have been even if they say, go and work in hospitals, uh, go and do all kinds of other things. Not necessarily the army is the problem right now. It's they want you to close the Torah and stop learning Torah and do other things, which they don't want to do. They don't want to do it for their own business. Later, when they become 25, 26, they still learn. They rather live simple, poor life, learn Torah, and prepare the eternity than to go and make money and go into business and, and make a lot of wealth, but being far away from Hashem and the Torah. It's not necessarily because of the army. Even business. Even you come to most of them, you tell them, come, leave the yeshiva, will give you a great job. Most of them, nine out of 10, would not agree. It's no question here. So no, no, I want to be a Talmid, Avrech. I want to learn Torah. So it's not necessarily, the army has another problem. It's not mothers, guys and girls, thousands of abortions every, every year in the Israeli army, thousands, many thousands of abortions from what's happening over there. The food's supposed to be kosher, but most of the soldiers are secular, so they don't even know how to separate meat and dairy, and it's all in the same sink. I was a soldier. I know what's going on. Today, it's a lot worse than my day, because my day wasn't the generation of internet and Facebook and YouTube and the culture of the goyim 24-7. It was not as bad. So today, it's even much worse. So it's very difficult. There's no tefillot, no yeshivot, no, no kviyat itim la Torah. 
many things that people would like as a, to, as a, as a minimum lifestyle of a religious Jew, none of it he has in Yari. He cannot do. He cannot have minyan. They have exercises. They bring women to sing in ceremonies, in uh, memorial days. They bring a woman and she sings in front of the religious and they have to leave. And then when they leave, they go to jail because they're not allowed to leave. Create so many conflicts. It's a big problem. So what's the third option? The third option that the religious people would surrender and they will go to the army. But here comes the problem. First, the army doesn't need them. The army has enough soldiers right now. There's no report of any shortage in any group of the armies of soldiers. They have enough for what they need. So now they're going to need 100,000 soldiers extra, which are far away from being soldiers. They're all very not physical. They don't even know how to hold a gun. They're not athletes. They don't know how to hold the ball. It's very it's different kind of people. That's what we call in America nerds. You know, what are you going to make him? Commando? This Hasidish kid who's all his life learned Torah and, and he was tzaddik all his life. What do you tell him? Hey, Herschel, Kadima, take the machine gun and run. There's Hamas, Ahmed is coming. What's Herschel going to do? Shir la ma'alot. What does he know? What's going to be? You understand what I'm talking about? So what's going to happen? They will go crazy. It will drive them crazy. What did we do to ourselves? We brought these people into the army. What are we going to do with them? Plus, if you have also lots of ballet tshuva that knows how to talk to secular people, in one year, they turn almost all the army into religious people. Now, all the, now plus, there's another problem. Even the secular soldiers, when they see that the religious soldiers get rights that they are not getting, what do you think is going to happen? Like now in America, in jail, all the, uh, the non-Jewish uh, prisoners, they also want glad kosher food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they want kosher food. They know it's better than regular. Oh, what, I have to be Jewish to eat kosher? This is what I eat, this is my diet. Cost them fortune now. You understand? So that's going to be, I think in the end, everything will work out for the best, the best way Hashem wants it. Yes, we have to give our life for the Torah. We have to do what the rules and what the G'dolei Ador tells us to do. That's why we have chief rabbis, to show us the way, what to do, what not to do. But I think that maybe this all move, move is that Hashem already is tired of the situation that more than 70% of his children are in the mud and have no idea who he is. They never met him. They don't know who their father is. Imagine a nation that 70% of the people do not know who their father is. You understand? That's what's happening right now. So maybe Hashem will show him who the father is in a strange way. In a strange way. Sometimes people that criticize you and attack you, and thanks to them, you have a great event. I'm talking from experience. <laughs> you know, all this publicity is supposedly negative. In the end, a lot of curious people want to know what the noise is about. And they come in and they get hooked. And then I get wonderful letters from them. Whoa, where is the provocative statements that they're talking about? It was a wonderful lecture, and another one, and another one, and now him and his wife and his friends, they all sit all day and what? So maybe the only way to get this anti-religion person to listen to Shiore Torah was to make something provocative. Otherwise, he would not come. He would not agree. Now it's action. Same thing, the debate. The debate boosts the website so much greater than before. Why? People who didn't want to hear Shiore Torah, they don't want to come listen to lectures. But when they hear a war between a rabbi and a priest, ah, action. <laughs> action. Through that action, they started to listen to other lectures. And Baruch Hashem, they became many of them Shomrei Mitzvot. Any questions before we finish? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, Abraham, the uh, Abraham Avinu, the Jewish people. Yeah. One of the ten people went to the... Yes, Eliezer, the, yes. the servant of Abraham. Uh, and it's non-Jew also. Yeah. Yeah. There was a case I read a long time ago in a book. Uh, there was a Jew in Roman time. He killed 200,000 Jews. But he, he did one thing. Because of that, he went to heaven alive. Menorah. He didn't give up Menorah. And everybody complained. said, how can you, you know, let him um, kill so many Jews and... For, for that long 
Arab, he's You sure that it's not a fairy tale from New York Times? No, no, no. I read the news. Okay, I, don't, I, I never heard that story. Show me the source, then I'll, I'll learn it further and I'll let you know. Any more questions? Any more? Baruch Hashem, we got away with one question only. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen. <laughs>